I'm going to start off by recalling from 40 years ago, from my time in the Ministry of Health as a very youthful director of biomedical engineering, believe it or not, that was me. I had the, the fortune of being in charge of the technology services for all the hospitals in Sri Lanka. And it came to my attention that some radiographers at the National Cancer Institute at Maharagama were misusing the cobalt radiation therapy machines for processing gemstones. In there is a source of highly radioactive cobalt, which gives out very powerful radiation called gamma rays. And these gamma rays selectively kill cancer cells. And they're pointed at wherever the cancer is on the patient. What the radiographers were doing was dismantling this part of it and putting in a bundle of gems so the gems were irradiated and the patient wasn't. The patients would lie there all day thinking that they were getting treatment and they weren't. Hundreds, possibly thousands of innocent patients were treated using these machines without actually having any benefit. And so one day I went on spec at about six o'clock in the evening entered the treatment room and I found a radiographer there who had dismantled the machine and was just taking out a bag of uh, blue sapphires from the machine. So of course, alarm was sounded, and he was arrested, and there was a prosecution in the High Court in which I was the government's star witness. The case against this man, brought about by the Attorney General, was on the allegation that he had damaged government property, a very serious offence. And the case was presented, and when it came to cross-examination, his counsel asked me, very deferentially, so Mr. Pethiagudu, what was the value of the damage that he caused to this machine? And I had to say, that, well, there wasn't any cost to it because we quite easily reassembled it. He had dismantled it, put the gems in, and all we had to do was assemble it again. And that one statement was sufficient to have the man acquitted because he had not damaged any government property. So he was set off, complete with gems. He was set free. As for the patients, the hundreds or thousands of patients who were abused by this system, there was no redress because we don't have a law that covers the patients. I mentioned this in the context of why ethics is so relevant in the education of people involved in government service and especially in the medical industry in general. So in the context of what I'm going to talk about, I think of corruption as any kind of dishonest behavior, but especially when there is a gradient, an imbalance of power between the corrupt person who's usually more powerful, and the person who's less powerful, you and I, the victims of corruption. And I look at corruption very broadly, not just in terms of bribery, but in terms of nepotism, embezzlement, cronyism, and so many other things that rot our society. Transparency International publishes every year an index of corrupt countries. And if you look at their index, you see that Sri Lanka's pretty brown. In fact, out of 180 countries that they assess, we are number 115. And when you look at this map, you quickly see the green countries where corruption is low and everyone else where corruption is high. And you quickly infer that there seems to be a relationship between prosperity and corruption. In countries where the per capita GDP is low, tend to be more corrupt than the more prosperous countries. And this seems to correlate with the degree of interpersonal and public trust that we have. The trust that the patients at Maharagama Hospital had that they were getting a genuine treatment. A trust that we, civil society, had that the radiographer was doing his job honestly. And this issue of trust has come to be studied extensively in science. And when we plot graphs for various countries, 
looking at the extent of corruption, their per capita GDP income, and the levels of social trust. I'll come to some data that will uh, show that more clearly. You see that the countries with the most societal trust tend to be the richer countries, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, and so on. And then the basket cases of the developing world, us lot, are found there at the bottom left. Even if you look at European countries, you find that the poorer European countries have greater degrees of corruption, and the richer ones are the same lot that turn up every time on the top right. Now, this has become a subject of scientific inquiry, and as a result of that, we've seen a flurry of papers being published worldwide examining these issues, trust, corruption, against GDP income or GDP performance across the globe. This is one of my favorite studies, and it performed a wonderful experiment across 40 countries where the scientists pretended that they had found a wallet on the street. The wallet contained about $17 and a name card with the owner's name and telephone number. And the scientist would go into a, a random shop, hand the wallet to a shopkeeper and say, I'm in a terrible rush, I just found this on the floor, could you take care of it? And he pushes off. And then they would wait to see whether they got a phone call from the shopkeeper saying, I found your wallet. They did this 17,000 times in 40 different countries. And this lost wallet experiment has become an excellent indicator of the degree of social trust and honesty in countries across the world. That's what it looks like. The same people end up to be most trusting, those Scandinavian countries, Switzerland, and so on. Sri Lanka sadly wasn't tested. But surprisingly, if you look at the United Kingdom, they don't fare very well. This is a country that most of us think of as being generally an honest country. They fall out pretty much in the middle of the spectrum. And the numbers I've put here in the large numbers is the corruption index from Transparency International. So you see that the least corrupt countries are also where people are the most honest. But then there are a few interesting outliers. For example, if you take Poland, Poland is a relatively corrupt country, but with very honest people. So you have dishonest governments and honest people. And this pattern repeats itself. For example, Russia is number 141 in the corruption list, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, but with some of the most honest people. And this is why I said this question of authority is very relevant when it comes to corruption. Corruption is an exploitation of authority. When people are given power, they become bad people. You hear the expression that absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that is true of every government that is not held to account. The interesting thing that these experimenters found was that when there was money in the wallet, we would have thought that the temptation to not report the wallet as stolen would have been greater, that the shopkeeper wouldn't have called up and said, I found your wallet because they can then pocket the money. But when there was money in the wallet, the chances that they called were much higher. That is the spread you see here. So no money is the yellow spot, with money is the red spot, and you can see that in every country across the world, if there was money in the wallet, the chances were much greater that they would contact the owner and say, we found your wallet. When you increase the amount of money to $100, which in any of these countries is a lot of money, the chances that the wallet was reported as stolen went up by 10%. People became even more honest. When they could have kept the $100, they didn't. They called up in every one of these countries and said, we found your wallet, which is why it underlines the fact that people basically are honest. I think we all have this common experience even in our own societies, our own homes, with staff or servants, that Sri Lankan people also tend to be very honest. It's just the leadership that gets spoiled. And they even put a house key in the wallet. And when there was a house key, again, 
the chances of the lost wallet having been found and reported to the owner went up by another 10%. But as I said, Sri Lanka wasn't included in that set of countries, but here's one where Sri Lanka was included. As you know, the United Nations is headquartered in New York. 195 countries have diplomatic missions in New York for the United Nations. And those diplomats have diplomatic immunity. They can't be prosecuted under American law. They can do what they like. And the worst that, that will happen to them is they're deported and sent home. New York is one of the world's busiest cities. If you've been there, you know it's really difficult to find parking. So these diplomats very often would park in the wrong place and get a parking ticket, all of them. This is a risk that they all run. And what these scientists did was they went and examined the records in the New York mayor's office for parking tickets issued to diplomats and looked at which countries had not been paying up their parking tickets and which ones had. These countries had not a single unpaid parking ticket. These are the honest countries. Now, the usual suspects, those countries we talked about of being honest, the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, are all there in green. But also a few surprises, Burkina Faso, the Central African Republic, two of the poorest countries on the planet with honest diplomats. So how many parking tickets do you reckon that the average Sri Lankan diplomat had in New York that had not been paid? The average per diplomat was 17. And that underlines the fact that corruption, at least in part, is a societal, cultural problem in every country in which it manifests itself. Now, by now, having seen the map I showed you, you're probably thinking, all right, it's a cultural problem, but all the countries in which corruption is low are where white people live, and we're all brown people in the corrupt world. Is there a genetic predisposition to be corrupt if you're brown? Valid question, but the data doesn't support that hypothesis. That is not to say, however, that there is no genetic predisposition to corruption. Some of us are born with a criminal tendency. Social scientists have a technical word for people with a genetic predisposition to corruption. They call them men. If you look in Valika de Prism, 95% of the inmates are male. Women tend to be a lot less corrupt than men. And that's why I was disappointed when I saw the photograph of the cabinet the other day 20 people in the cabinet, only two women. If AKD had put more women in his cabinet, he can be more sure that his dream of a corruption-free government will be realized. So I want to walk you through this issue of trust, because this is pivotal to corruption. A trusting society is not a corrupt society. And that brings me to snakes. Snake bite is a serious medical problem in Sri Lanka. About 30,000 people present to hospital with snake bite, and despite the best treatment available, about 45 of them die in hospital. But at the level of the community, about 80,000 people are bitten by snakes, and about 400 of them will die because they don't go to hospital, they are treated by the village uh, doctor. There are five snakes that are responsible for most of these bites. We have more than 100 species of snakes in Sri Lanka, but only five of them are really uh, an issue in a medical context. And there are complicating factors with snake bite. First off, more than half of snake bites don't involve the snake actually in injecting venom into your body. It's called a dry bite. Well over 50% of snake bites don't involve venom. You're going to be fine, even though you have a panic attack and you go to hospital, you don't really need treatment. The second thing is, in most snake bites, people don't know what the snake that bit them was. They might take the snake to hospital having killed it or put it in a bottle, but then most of these snakes are just brown snakes and most people are not very good at identifying them, so the doctor in the hospital doesn't know which bite to treat you for. And the venoms of these different snakes behave very differently. Some of them are neurotoxins, some of them are hemotoxins, they affect your blood clotting, and that's how they kill you. So 
the treatment of snake bite would be a lot more efficient if only we had a test where when the patient goes to hospital, first of all, we can find out, does he have venom in the blood, in which case he needs to be treated? And secondly, which snake did that venom come from? Now, up to this time, there is no such test. You are blindly treated with so-called polyvalent antivenoms, and those antivenoms have two disadvantages. One is that they can kill you because they are made from horse serum, and some people get an allergic reaction to the horse serum, and that needs another medical emergency. And then you have the problem of cost. A vial of antivenom costs about 10,000 rupees, and usually a patient needs about 10 vials for a snake bite treatment. So it's hugely expensive. So there has always been a need for a cheap blood test. And of course, the hour produced the man. This is Kalina Madhuagi, who became the youngest professor in Peradeniya University at the age of 38. And he and his friend, Anjana Silva, both came and worked in my lab as medical students. You know, the pre-intern year, the year be between doing your finals and waiting to get your internship. And they were in incredibly productive and they both remained friends of mine through my life. Kalana and I discussed this problem and he put his mind to it, published a paper with a solution and started working on developing the simple test that will do this job we were talk talking about. He needed some capital. I spoke to some friends who are well healed and they came up with six million rupees, which bought him the equipment and the gear he needed to develop the test. And within six months, we had a functional test. Kalana took his test and went and sat at Munaragala Hospital for a couple of weeks. They have a lot of snake bites there. And he examined the blood samples that came into the lab from snake bite victims, retesting them with his kit as against the gold standard test that is done called the ELISA test, which is expensive and slow, which is why we can't use it all the time as a bedside test. And he found that his little test worked 100% of the time. And so the next step, of course, was to make this into a kit. We did an estimate. It would cost about 200 rupees. There were enough donors who said, we will fund this so that we can give it free to hospitals. It's so cheap. But of course, in order to protect the intellectual property, we had to file a patent. So Kalana went off to the National Intellectual Property Management Office, the patent office in Colombo, and he applied for two patents. He had two different technologies at work, paying the fee of 16,000 rupees. And then he waited for his patent to come. A year went by, two years went by, and then one day searching on the internet, he found that his patent had been registered under somebody else's name in India. The company that registered this India had no track record of any kind of medical research. It became very evident that the intellectual property office in Sri Lanka had sold his intellectual property to somebody in India. Now, six and a half years later, the intellectual property office has still not said whether they'll grant him a patent or not, because they know darn well that they cheated him. And they cheated Sri Lanka because we can't have the test now without paying royalties to some company in Chennai. That is why trust is so important, because if you're registering a patent, you have no option but to give your intellectual property to the patent office. The one place you have to absolutely trust people. So my advice to anyone in Sri Lanka who has an invention worth registering is to go and apply for a patent in America or England in an honest country, because you can't even trust the patent office in Sri Lanka. It is the perfect crime. You can't catch them because all they do is just scan your patent and send it off. There's no way they can be caught. But I'm saying this publicly because I think it should be a matter of public record. And what happened to Kalana? He was so disgusted, he gave up. He got a nice position in Australia and now he's a professor in an Australian university. So another one bites the dust. Trust is the key. Not just trust between individuals and trust between individuals and institutions, but trust at the societal level, which we call social capital. Countries with high levels of trust in society tend to be much more successful, tend to have much higher rates of economic growth than countries like ours. So what were the lessons that we learned? People tend to be more honest than their governments 
everywhere in the world. Richer countries tend to have more honest people than poorer countries. People in rich countries are more cooperative towards others. They hold the door open for the person who comes behind them. But here's something that was counterintuitive, the last one. Punishment works a lot better in those rich countries with high trust than in our societies. When we look at confronting bribery and corruption in Sri Lanka, most of us think in terms of punishment, in terms of law, in terms of bribery commissions, in terms of policing. But actually, that doesn't seem to have the desired effect. The way in which we need to address corruption must come from a different direction. I'll get there. But before I get there, I want to say how we're accumulating this knowledge on a scientific footing. A lot of this work comes from what we call public goods games. These are fun. These are little games that we play with small numbers of people in different societies across different religions, different races, different economic backgrounds, different ethnicities. Assume there are four people like that. The green one can be you. And assume that I give each of you $1,000. Now I say, you can keep the $1,000, that's yours to keep, or you can put all of it or some of it into the pot here and whatever's in the pot, I will double and then distribute amongst all of you. So assume that all four people put $1,000 in the pot. Pot has $4,000, I double it, it becomes $8,000. I distribute it equally amongst everybody. And so each person ends up with $2,000. But now assume that we have a slightly different flavor. This time, three people put their $1,000 in the pot. One selfish person decides to hold on to their $1,000. What happens now? Now, there's $3,000 in the pot, which gets doubled, becomes $6,000. That gets distributed equally amongst all four of them. So $1,500 each. Now what happens? The selfish person ends up with more money than the people who are honest and contributing to the pot. Now, if you think of this public goods game in the context of so many social examples, income tax is pretty much like that. Those of us who pay tax, pay tax to the treasury, and that money is distributed, regardless of whether people pay tax or not, for everyone to benefit from. You get your education, your health, your roads, your defense, from the money that comes into the government from income tax. Social security is another form of the same thing. Enlisting in the army is the ultimate public goods game, because you give not just your time, but potentially your life but everybody benefits from the resulting, the defense of the country that results. To me, my favorite public goods game is one that hasn't been published, but I'm thinking of publishing it because no one had thought of it, is blood donation. It turns out if you look at blood do donation statistics across the world, that depending on whether you're a low, middle or high income country, you give less or more blood. Why should this be the case? Why do people in rich countries donate blood more frequently than people in poor countries? After all, in rich countries, we all know we've been there. Time is a lot more precious than it is here. But still, people take the time because all you're donating when you donate blood is your time. And still, we, in countries like this, don't think about donating our time by donating blood. So how much blood do Sri Lankans donate? Here's a good result. We, we donate more blood than our economic status suggests. Why? This is a really cool result. I like it because the National Blood Transfusion Service many decades ago started thinking outside the box. What they did was they lynched onto the fact that Sri Lankans are hugely religious people. 92% of Sri Lankans say that religion plays an important part in their daily lives. And the Blood Transfusion Service capitalized on this by saying that if you give blood, it was akin to giving alms. You accumulated merit. And as a result of this delicious lie, 85% of blood transfusions today are given in, on full moon days. So I want to park those examples there. I gave you those by way of context so that you have a feeling of sympathy when we go in to look at 
actual incidences of instances of corruption as to what might have been driving them. So this is a bit like, corruption is a bit like uh, gelato. It comes in many flavors. And we'll sample some of them. So the Common or Garden vanilla level of corruption, if you like, is making money from infrastructure projects for which you borrowed capital. You all know these examples. If you just take those four, they add up to about $1.8 billion. Say 10% of that goes as corruption. I say 10% advisedly. That's about $180 million, a lot of money. I say 10% because WikiLeaks, as you probably remember from a few years ago, published a diplomatic correspondence between Ambassador Blake and the State Department in Washington, where the ambassador told his bosses in, New York, in Washington that Basil has earned the nickname Mr. 10% for demanding 10% commission on every project that he passes. Basil himself acknowledges the fact that he is known as Mr. 10%. So those are easy levels of corruption and very easily addressed. If you have a transparent procurement process, you can stop them quite easily. Let's go to the next level. The next level is where you have monopolies. There are lots of monopolies, real or imagined, that government manages to create for itself. We've created a monopoly, for example, with Sri Lankan Airlines and Airbus, because now Sri Lankan Airlines is stuck with Airbus. They can't buy planes from the only competitor, Boeing, because their pilots have been trained on Airbus, their technicians have been trained on Airbus, all their maintenance equipment is for Airbus and so on. So Airbus has very little incentive to bribe them because they know they've got a captive market. But still, in order to keep those good relationships, they grease the wheels by paying out modest bribes to officials in airlines like Sri Lanka. And they got caught, not to us, they got caught to the European Union. And in 2020, the United States, the European Union, and the UK prosecuted Airbus for paying bribes to people in countries like Sri Lanka and fined them a massive four billion, with a B, dollars. Four billion dollars. How much of that did we get? Zero. But they caught Airbus paying a bribe, $16 million, to the wife of the CEO of Sri Lankan Airlines, who had incorporated a shelf company in Brunei, a foreign bank account, and she got caught, not to us, but to the British government. Of course, this became world news. And the British government gave the entire body of evidence to the Sri Lankan government in 2020. So we made a big song and dance because this was now public knowledge. The CEO and his wife were arrested. They were taken to court and enlarged on bail. I don't think any of us has learned what happened to them after that. Four and a half years, no progress on any prosecution. The pressure was put on Sri Lankan Airlines for one year saying, what are you doing about it? You're still doing business with Airbus. You should be prosecuting Airbus for bribing your employees. Sri Lankan Airlines refused to do it under huge pressure eventually in 2021. They made a media release that they were going to prosecute Airbus and claim $1 billion in compensation. That lasted one day. That prosecution never happened. Now, three and a half years later, we're still waiting for the $1 billion. And in the meantime, Sri Lankan Airlines has a brought forward loss this year of 611 billion rupees. Another form of corruption comes from unsolicited offers. This has become quite a fashion and Ranil Vikramasinghe took it to a high point of his career. From 2012 to 2024, electronic travel authorizations for tourists wishing to visit Sri Lanka were processed by Mobitel for the Department of Immigration and Immigration pretty much free of charge. But in April this year, Tiran Alas and Ranil Vikramasinghe decided that this wasn't good enough. They had to give this to a foreign company. A foreign company being VFS. I suspect many of you who go for overseas visas in Colombo will have encountered VFS offices. VFS is a global company. 
And they put forward a company called GBS blah blah, system that was free of charge until this year, now would charge every tourist $1850 per visa as a service fee, plus another $7.50 as a convenience fee, totaling more than $25 per visa. This money never came to Sri Lanka. It was going straight from the tourists into the offshore account in Dubai, set up under the aegis of Mrs. Vikramasinghe and Alas. Of course, the Controller General of Immigration and Immigration was complicit in this. He is now in prison because Mr. Chandra Jayaratna and I went to the Supreme Court and complained about this and the court let me stop there and say, thank goodness we still have an honest judiciary in this country. The court put him on remand until the case comes up again in January. This year, Sri Lanka is expecting to have 2.3 million tourists. You multiply the amount of money that these guys were planning to pay, pay to IBS GBS, it comes to $59 million per year. And they signed a 16-year contract. That's what you call money for jam. So this overseas company ends up getting, in that period, almost a billion dollars of money that should have rightfully been the revenue of the Sri Lankan state. I think of this as a kind of corruption futures financial instrument, the gift that keeps on giving for 16 years. It's a new kind of corruption that was invented by the government of Ranil Vikramasinghe. Let's move on to another flavor of corruption. This is called fixing the specification. If you think about it, if government has to buy a computer or a car or an aeroplane or a MRI scanner for a hospital, it has to write a technical specification for what exactly it wants to buy. Now, technical specifications tend to be long and complex documents because they have to be written with a lot of technical jargon. This is a technical specification for a tender from Nepal. I don't want to ruffle too many feathers in Sri Lanka. I have a wife and family to feed. So <laughs> let's take just one clause from that long technical specification. It says that the X-ray tube associated with the CT scanner must have a heat storage capacity of 7.5 mega heat units. Just as far as you're concerned, a random number, a parameter. But by selecting that number, the organization that called for the tender has disqualified one of the world's largest manufacturers of CT scanners, General Electric, I'm sure you all know the name, whose CT scanners have a heat storage capacity of 6.3 mega heat units. Now, if you ask me as a biomedical engineer, is there a qualitative difference in the images you get from the 6.3 mega heat unit machine and the 7.5? I have to tell you there isn't. But still, that one number has been inserted there to disqualify General Electric. By fixing a few numbers in a technical specification like that, the person who writes the specification can eliminate everybody except the guy who's paying him the money. <coughs> this happens all the time. It's really difficult to catch. And you have to have systems of procurement that are really transparent if you want to get to the bottom of it. Because assume that one of the people who's disadvantaged complains, he can be sure that in the next tender, they'll cut him out again. So complaining publicly doesn't work. You have to complain privately, but we have no mechanism for that in Sri Lanka. Then let's come to a way of making easy money. This is what I think of as extortive capital expenditure corruption, made famous by a few ministers in the Rajapaksa government and taken to a fine art under Ranil Vikramasinghe. Here, the minister or the high official in the ministry does nothing. He just stands on a side and let the process go on. Tenders are called, they're evaluated, the specifications are written, they go to the tender board, they go to the cabinet, and they get approved. And the minister stands on a side and pretends to be Mother Teresa. But he's waiting, because once the tender board has made the decision, it's the minister's ministry that has to give the letter of award. Now, the tender is waiting for his letter of award, and there is no letter of award forthcoming. So a month goes by, and then he comes to the ministry and says, hang on, I won that tender. Can I please have my letter of award? 
And they say, oh, we're very busy right now. Can you come back next month? And the guy is harassed around until he comes and says, how much? And at that point, the letter of award is issued. This was actually even referenced by the Japanese ambassador before he left the country. And just the day before yesterday, the NPP government put out a new set of procurement guidelines. It was gazetted, in which they have tried to fill this, they have tried to address this issue. So now, according to the new procurement guidelines, within three days of the tender board making a decision, the letter of award has to be given to the successful tender. If you don't do it, the officials who, who delayed will be held collectively accountable. But will that solve the problem? No, it won't. Now we will see the letters of award being given immediately, very efficiently, in conformity with the rules. What happens next? The guy goes off and he performs on his tender. He does the service or he, he procures and delivers the goods. Then he needs to get his payment. Now he comes with his invoice and says, sir, can you pay me my 100 million rupees for this tender? And at that point he's told, oh, we're very sorry, there's no money. The treasury hasn't sent us money. Can you come back next month? Now he's got to wait for months to collect his check until he comes back and says, how much? You can't really solve these problems unless you're very sharp. And that, I think, even though we've got a cabinet and a president who are ultra honest, I'm saying that without any kind of sarcasm in my voice, because I genuinely believe these people want to be the first government in Sri Lanka's history that is really honest. But corruption is not going to end because ministers and the president are honest. Corruption will flourish unless you stamp it out at the root. The most sublime form of corruption is what I think of as regulatory corruption. If you think about it, Sri Lanka is a nation of regulations. We have regulations for everything. If you want to register a business, regulations. If you want to open a tourist hotel, you've got to have regulations. Open a spa, get a liquor license, open a, a school, everything needs regulations. And regulations are there for people to pay bribes. I was chairman of the tea board, as you heard. The tea board has more than 100 regulations that regulate the passage of tea from the tea bush to the ship that exports it. At each one of those stages, some officer has to say he approves it and authorizes it. And if you want to expedite the system, money changes hands. And this is true of every regulation agency in government. The customs, as you know, is notorious for this. So I'm going to select today the National Medicines Regulatory Authority, which often gets in the news, and take just one area of that, which applies to my former discipline, medical engineering, because to import any medical device to Sri Lanka, whether it's a stethoscope or an MRI scanner, you have to get a registration from the NMRA. And in order to get that registration, you have to provide a sample. Now, if you're importing MRI scanners, it's crazy to expect you to give a sample. But the law says you must give a sample. So you don't get your registration unless you get a waiver to the law from a suitably competent official, and you all know how you get that. It becomes worse because the customs interpret the NMRA law to mean that a device is also a spare part associated with any device. So when you want to get a spare part, you've got to first go and get an NMRA registration for the spare part. Now, the NMRA has a waiting list of between one and two years for these applications because there are so many applications. And you know from a car, a car is made of about, of about 30,000 parts. If it comes to a CT scanner, it's about five times as many parts. So when a CT scanner breaks down in a hospital and you have to get an emergency part, you can import the part, but before customs will let it out, you've got to go and get an NMRA registration to get the part out of the port. That takes one year. Now, in the meantime, patients are dying. So what happens? The company pays a little money. Regulations are the bane of Sri Lanka's bribery and corruption network. And unless you can simplify regulations and make sure that they make sense, it makes no sense to regulate parts, parts of a stethoscope as medical devices, a tube of rubber 
has to get registration before it can import it if you want to replace the, the tube in your stethoscope. It's crazy. And finally, wind power. This exploited a loophole in the law called government to government transactions. As you know, earlier this year in May, Ranil Vikramasinghe's government awarded a contract to Adani Corporation of India for the supply of wind power based at Mana and Poonarin. As soon as this was announced, I issued one of my YouTube tirades and caused there to be some controversy. And then Professor Sarath Kotagama, Professor Nimal Gunatilaka, the Bishop of Mana and I went to the Supreme Court to try and stop this. This is one way of spending your EPF, is litigating against the government. What was the reason? Here's the cabinet decision, and you can see that the, the price that Mr. Vikramasinghe's cabinet awarded to Adani was 8.26 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. The same month in May this year, local companies had a separate tender for putting up wind power plants in Manor, and they offered the government 4.88 cents. The going price for wind power in India is about three US cents. And we had approved 8.26 cents. If you take the difference in value that was awarded to Adani be between the 4.88 cents that local tender is offering and the 8.26 cents that Ranil Vikramasinghe awarded to Adani, over 20 years for Manana alone, it comes to $1.35 billion. This is on top of what is a really good price already. 400 billion rupees. So think about it, uh, national education spend for education and higher education this year is 180 billion rupees. More than two years worth of education given as graft to an Indian company. The pretext for this is that there was an ongoing agreement between the government of India and the government of Sri Lanka. Kanchan Abhijay Sekhara said this repeatedly, as did Ranil Vikramasinghe. There never was such an agreement, and there still isn't. This was an absolute lie. They said it so convincingly and so often that even Prime Minister Harini was talking about this uh, so-called government-to-government agreement, even though there wasn't one. And then we saw just last week the FBI and the Department of Justice in the United States prosecuting Adani for bribes paid in India. What did Adani pay those bribes for? It's a 54-page indictment, and it reads a bit like a mystery novel. The bribes were paid fundamentally to pay officials, such as in this case, a bribe of $228 million to the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh, so that Andhra Pradesh would buy solar electricity from Adani at a much higher price than was available in the market. That's exactly what they're doing in Sri Lanka. But it was left to the Americans to discover this, not the Sri Lankans. Thankfully, this case also is now before the Supreme Court. And the previous year, just last year, Mr. Vikramasinghe awarded the Colombo West Container Terminal to Adani, gave him 51% of the shares without any kind of process, keeping only 15% for the Sri Lanka Ports Authority. The rest of the money was being loaned by the International Development Finance Corporation, a US government agency, which now says it is reviewing this loan because of Adani's history of corruption in India. As soon as the Department of Justice prosecution was initiated last year, the Kenyan government immediately said they're canceling all Adani contracts, two and a half billion dollars worth of contracts. We in Sri Lanka aren't so lucky because Kenya is separated from India by 4,000 kilometers of sea. We have a different problem altogether. And that is that we are in the proximity to a big country that is well known as a bully. Those of you my age will remember in 1987, the Indian Air Force overflying Sri Lanka with impunity, and the so-called peacekeeping force, an Indian invasion, that took place the same year. Big countries tend to bully small countries who are their neighbors. The US bullies Cuba, China bullies the Philippines, Russia bullies Ukraine. This is not news. India bullies everybody except Pakistan because Pakistan's got nukes. 
So Pakistanis are left alone. So when we address the problem of systemic corruption in Sri Lanka, we have to remember that this is not a new phenomenon. Our country's first bribery commission was appointed by Governor Gordon in 1885. Mr. Nihal Sanavir Ratna, former Secretary General of Parliament, wrote his memoirs in which he pointed out that the first MP to be kicked out of Parliament in Sri Lanka for bribery was in 1962. Corruption is very much part of the fabric of our society. But what I've tried to do is to give you the kind of scientific context for why societies are less or more honest and to integrate that context into the kinds of corruption we are seeing, the gelato flavors of corruption we see in Sri Lanka, so that you can see how they can be stopped. All of these corrupt practices can be mitigated or stopped if we think about it craftily. But by thinking about it merely in terms of crime and punishment, in terms of laws and policing, we will never solve the problem. You have to go to the root of it and stop corruption before it happens, preventively. Even in medicine, we know that prevention is better than cure. And that's what we are failing to get. That is the penny that still hasn't dropped on the NPP government. That being honest at the top isn't enough. You've got to be smart to catch corruption where it happens and to stop it from happening in the first place. Thank you very much.